Okay, welcome to lecture 16. And we're going to be talking about alkyl halides, nucleophilic substitution. And what I like about this book is it breaks up, we're going to be talking about an SN2 and an SN1 reaction, and it breaks up the E1s and E2s. So um, exam two will cover chapters four through six. Okay, and we're on chapter six here. We've talked about chapter four, um, the reaction mechanism of free radical halogenation of alkanes. So that's uh, the first reaction, and then we're going to talk about an SN2 reaction and an SN1 reaction. So you basically have three reactions in which you have to predict products, determine starting material, and also be able to write out uh, or draw the reaction mechanism. And so when you do that, you have to label uh, for free radical halogenation. You have to be able to do initiation, propagation one, and propagation two steps. And we'll show you um, the other for SN1 and SN2. Um, so that's the chapters here. So let's start with first, we're going to, in this section, we're going to define um, the alkyl halide. So you have to be able to discern what an alkyl halide is and what is not so you know what substrate works for the starting material. And then we're going to talk about how to synthesize. Synthesize is this uh, chemistry word for alkyl halides. The alkyl halide is your starting material. Okay. And how do you do that? You do that from free radical halogenation. So that's going to be a review. And then we're going to go into the details of SN2 reactions and SN1 reactions. And then in another um, lecture section, I will work um, 9A, Pogel 9A, and that is SN2. And then on a separate one, I will also work the Pogel 9B, which is covering SN1. Okay, so you're, for this whole chapter, there's two Pogel assignments. Okay, so let's start. So alkyl halides is a functional group, and um, a lot of your alkyl halides are really bad for the environment um, because they have halogens. So if you've heard of chlorofluorocarbons, carbons, these are um, stuff like carbon, CL3, CH3. This is a cleaning, a lot of your dry cleaning. The definition of dry cleaning is not to use water. They use these um, halogenated um, carbons. Uh, you have um, tet, uh, if you've heard of Teflon, this is the Teflon monomer. Okay, and you have a carbon fluorine bond, um, but that's the monomer for Teflon. But Teflon is actually um, this long carbon, and every carbon has a fluorine. So this is Teflon. Why is Teflon um, so valuable to us? Because you can heat this up to 400 degrees and it does not catch fire. And the reason why is because this carbon fluorine bond is very hard to break. Um, if you don't believe me, look at the bond association energy between carbon and fluorine. It's one of the highest. And that's because they're similar to size, carbon and fluorine and um, they have a strong overlap. But the problem is these uh, hal halogens do not break down. And um, there's an excellent movie, I can't think of what it's called, um, maybe I'll come up with it, but it's about West Virginia, and um, it just came out last year, but it's about the halogens in DuPont, and it's about, and you can Google it, um, it's uh, about 
um, P F O A. And there's like scenes in Cincinnati, but that's perfluorooctanoic acid. So if you look up um, the movie perfluorooctanoic acid. In fact, I'm gonna. If we were in class. I'd make you Google it right now. So let me Google it right here. P F O A. West Virginia movie. And just to give you a name, the film, Dark Waters. Yeah, that's what it is. And I wish you all would watch that movie if you get a chance when you want to take a break from working your sapling um, because it would give you an idea of what these alkyl halides and the damages. They're um, pretty much only made synthetically. Um, about one in every three drug does have a halogen in it. But um, very few in nature have halogens. So this is definitely a man-made, um, most of these are man-made structures. All right, so what substrates work for us? On the, so what could be a starting material? Okay, so if we were in class, I would draw these um, compounds on the board. I draw probably about four or five. Let's see. Okay, and I would tell you to pick out the alkyl halide. So is the first structure an alkyl halide? Yes, this is an alkyl halide. Okay, and how do you know that? This carbon is an sp3 carbon, and it's bonded to a halogen. And you can do X for halogen. Okay, um, so this is your halogen, and it's an sp3 carbon. How do you know it's sp3? We've talked about that. So this carbon's bonded to four things, so sp3. If you add the subscripts, sp3, 1 plus 3 is 4. That's an sp3 carbon. What about the next one? Okay, so this carbon here, what you don't see is a hydrogen in back. Is that an sp3 carbon? Bond to 1, 2, 3, 4, yes. And does it have a halogen on it? Yes. Okay, so that's an alkyl halide. What about this one? This is no, okay. This is an sp2 carbon. And um, yes, it's bonded to a halogen, but sp2 carbons are not. This is called a vinyl halogen. Okay? This is also a vinyl. A vinyl is um, an sp2 carbon halogen. These are not alkyl halides. They will not undergo the reaction. Okay. Now, another thing you have to be able to do is you have to be able to classify these halogens. And when we talk about classifying, we're trying to decide whether something is a methyl, primary, secondary, tertiary. Okay. And the reason why you have to do this is I'm going to tell you every time classify. If you don't know what you're looking at, then you're not going to be able to solve your problems. I got to get you where you can solve problems. First way I get you to solve problems is I got to teach you what to look at. It's just like if you're three years old and you're trying to decide between a cat and a snake, okay? You have to describe features on the cat and the snake to determine what does the snake do versus what does the cat do. Same thing here. I have to be able to get you where you can look at these compounds and say that's an alkyl halide. That is not an alkyl halide. And then I need you to classify. So what would the first one be? Okay, this carbon is bonded to one halogen. Is this carbon bonded to any carbons? No. So we're just looking at this bond here, and you ask, is this carbon is bonded to any halogen or carbons? So this is zero. So this is a methyl. Okay, this is a methyl halide. What about this one? 
Okay, so we're going to look at this carbon that's bonded to the bromine. And then you ask how many carbons bonded to the um, alkyl halide carbon. You have one, two, so it's secondary. So that's a secondary alkyl halide. This one is not. We don't classify vinyls. Now, another thing you're going to see if you do your reading is you're going to see some R groups. Okay, so you might see something like this. Believe it or not, I was in graduate school before I knew what an R group was. Okay, R can be any just alkyl, alkyl group. So this R could be like this. This R could be like this. Okay, so sometimes in the nomenclature, when you're starting reactions and learning things, R group is just generic for these alkyl groups. So classify this. Alkyl halide, yes or no? Is an, is an sp3 carbon bonded to a halogen? Yes, so that's a, and then, so you want to be able to classify this. And this carbon is bonded to one, two carbons. So this would be a secondary alkyl halide. What about this? What about that one? So you look at the carbon bromine bond and you decide whether it is that an sp3 carbon bromine. Yes, one, two, three, four. So it is an alkyl halide. And then you say how many carbons bonded to this carbon? So you say one, two, three. So that would be a tertiary alkyl halide. Okay, so I expect you to be able to classify your halogens. Um, another nomenclature, just to get through your book, is um, you might see something called geminal dihalide and a vicinal dihalide. And these are Latin words for vicinal, it means neighbor, and geminal means twin. So here if you have a halogen on the same carbon, that would be a geminal dihalide. And if you have them on neighbor carbons, those would be vicinal dihalide. And I just give you the vocabulary. Okay, you all can read about the common uses and pesticides. It's very interesting. Watch the dark waters. Um, the structure, you can um, also see the structure is important. Um, you also have some excellent slides showing you that you have polarity here. Okay, so when you look at this, what's the dipole moment? Well, fluorine's your most electronegative, and so you could say this is delta minus, and this carbon, it pulls those electrons in that sigma bond towards the fluorine. So it polarizes this carbon-fluorine bond even more. And so you end up having a dipole that looks like that. And um, so the electronegativity, so what's increasing electronegativity trend? Okay, you know fluorine is the highest, and so it goes up the group. So you're looking at fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodide. These are your halogens. I'm going to tell you it's only these halogens that um, will participate as starting material in SN2, SN1 reactions. Okay, so this chapter is about substitution reactions. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to take a alkyl halide. Okay, so we'll take something like this. So what kind of alkyl halide is this? There's your carbon chlorine bond. And this carbon is bonded to one other carbon. So it's a primary alkyl halide, and it will undergo a substitution reaction. So we will, a substitution reaction replaces the halogen, in this case X is chlorine, with, and you'll learn a nucleophile.
okay we call it a nucleophile so if you had something like um, sodium cyanide rat poisoning right um, anytime you see your first peer, uh, group and second group metals just go ahead and make that a positive so that way you can see that this is a negative carbon okay and then you always start with that negative I mean that's where your electrons are going to go and substitution you'll see this is going to be a leaving group the halogen is going to be a leaving group and you're going to label all these just like you did acid base conjugate acid conjugate base so chlorine is a leaving group and it's going to take its electrons with it okay so chlorine is going to leave and that negative then is going to be in your reaction flask and it's going to hang out with your sodium because positive and negatives like each other that's a salt that's table salt and then you're going to replace the Cl with the nitrile. Just give me some more space here. The nitrile. And I'll make this. Let's make this yellow. Cn. Cn. It's very important that I draw the C. To the end. Now, you all should be able to draw the Lewis structure for that. Nitrogen likes three bonds, one lone pair. Carbon likes four bonds. So this is called a nitrile. Now we just made a nitrile. So we started with what is this? One chloro ethane. So we started with one chloroethane, that's our starting material, and we put it in a flask with sodium cyanide, rat poisoning, and we make salt, table salt, sodium chloride, which we don't care about it. I'm just teaching you so you know where it goes. Well, we care. We're organic chemists. We care about these carbons. We're making carbons. In the lab, I just wash that away in a separatory funnel. So what is this? You don't have to name the nitriles, but it, you did make a nitrile. You should be able to name the alkyl halides because that was chapter three. Okay, um, so you see the difference in the dipole moments, um, bond length. I'm not going to ask you about bond length, but um, this chlorine iodide bond has a, a longer bond length. Okay. Um, and, it's, and it's because, well, iodide is big. We call it the big Buick, okay? So when you have a little carbon, so that's a, a longer bond. An electronegativity difference here, this is a 2.7. And carbon, I think, is a 2. Point, is it on there? I think it's 2.5, okay? So a little bit of electronegativity difference. Not as much as fluorine. But um, you're going to learn that because iodide is so big, um, it is your best leaving group. And that's the kind of stuff I'm going to have to teach you is what's the best leaving group? What's the best nucleophile, electrophile, and naming them? Okay. So we're moving on. Um, how to prepare these? Let's do free alkyl halogenation. So how do you prepare? Um, free radical halogenation. Of alkanes. This is your first true organic chemistry reaction other than acid base. Um, let's do allylic um, halogenation. So Let's give you this example. Okay, so here we have, uh, and we're going to react this with bromine. Okay, and we're going to do some light. Now, you're going to learn that this, this is a lilic system, and this is called a lilic bromination. Now, this allylic is right here this is your lilic okay so an allylic carbon 
is an sp3 carbon next bonded next to an sp2 carbon okay that's your allylic and we know that allylic um, hydrogens so this is free radical halogenation I need to look at my BDE table okay so I'm gonna look at my BDE table and I'm gonna see do we see an allylic we see tertiary I see allylic maybe um, yeah allylic so it costs 372 372 kilojoules per mole to take what to take this hydrogen okay take that hydrogen um, a regular tertiary so if you compare that which is a tertiary alkyl halide so to take this hydrogen here tertiary 403 kilojoules per mole so what's the difference there's a good amount of difference there isn't there okay so that is why in free radical halogenation it's going to be this hydrogen that gets abstracted now you're going to learn that these um, in chapter 8 you're going to learn that bromine can add to this um, double bond so you don't want a lot of bromine so you can use a reagent called MBS okay MBS is in bromo sucks imid sucks okay and so whenever I see MBS I think oh we're doing free radical halogenation so MBS is here so N for the N bromo for the bromo here and then sucks imid is this poor carbon dicarbonyl you see that in the Krebs cycle if you go through that whole process all right so what happens is this will go into become this is an image an image is nitrogen bonded to two and this generates a little amount of BR and then when you hit it with light okay so you do the same mechanism for this so initiation is still BR, BR, put in your H new, homolytic cleavage, right? So we get the two half fish hook arrows. Propagation one, our starting material is this here, okay? So I'm going to draw this like this and then I'm going to put in my bromine radical and then my bromine radical is going to take the hydrogen and generate um, I got three electron flow arrows the free radical now watch what I do here what is the um, what's the hybridization of what's the hybridization of that carbon of the free radical that is an sp2 okay it's an sp2 that free radical is in an unhybridized p orbital you remember the shape of an unhybridized p orbital it's just a dumbbell shape these bonds here to these other carbons are hybridized sp2 so that means you have 33% s character and about 66% p character these things look like wiffle ball blasts okay they're not on hybridized p so when you have that you don't have stereochemistry so we lose our stereochemistry here folks okay now why did I choose this carbon hydrogen to abstract instead of this carbon because you learned that the um, free radical is electron deficient and therefore this methyl group here is more stabilizing of an electron deficient free radical than um, a secondary so if I would have taken the hydrogen from this allylic carbon here the bottom 
that would not be as stable as the tertiary. So that means the tertiary allylic carbon will, or hydrogen will be abstracted because it's more stable than the secondary. So what am I comparing? I'm comparing this intermediate versus if I abstracted the other hydrogen here. Okay, so this one's more stable. All right, that's selectivity. We, that's our word. Okay, plus, what else? HBr. HBr. Okay, that's propagation step one. Propagation step two, we're going to take this free radical loss of stereochemistry. This is called a free radical allylic system. And now we want to react this with, um, and go up here, it's going to be the HBr. HBr? Yep. Actually, no, I'm sorry. Not HBr. We generate our free radical, it's Br. So, forgive me. What am I thinking here? Okay, so let's do this. Br, Br, because we have to regenerate a new free radical. So we put our Br there. And then we generate the Br radical. Okay, so that is allylic bromination. And you can just brominate any of these um, halogens alkyl halide, or to make alkyl halides to prepare them. Okay. Now let's get into the reactions of this chapter. Let's talk about SN2 reactions. Okay. So SN2 reaction. Let's talk about what that word means. S means substitution. N means nucleophilic. And um, the two means bimolecular. And so what you have here is, we'll just do this one here. Now we've already talked about what alkyl halides undergo these reactions. So you have to have an alkyl halide, means the carbon has to be an sp3 carbon bonded to a halogen. And which halogens do this? Chlorine, bromine, and iodide. Okay, so here we have, and this is called an iodomethane. Okay, so iodomethane, and we do have an alkyl halide. And then let's react this with just like sodium hydroxide. Okay, so whenever you see sodium, you make that a plus, that makes that a minus. Draw your Lewis structure down here if you need to. Okay, draw your lone pairs. You're drawing this reaction mechanism. Now, this is your alkyl halide. And what kind of alkyl halide is, because I want you to classify it. It's a methyl. How do you know this? Because this carbon bonded to the halogen is not bonded to any other carbons. So it's a methyl alkyl halide. And this is your nucleophile. The nucleophile, I write like this, and you're going to see me write it like this. Okay. I do the double bond because you're going to get in Chapter 8 where you see that this double bond sometimes is your nucleophile. If I see lone pairs, I think a nucleophile. Negative charge, nucleophile. Okay, that's a nucleophile. So you see how we have some lone pairs here on the oxygen and we have a negative charge? That's how you spot nucleophile. Now for every, this is the reactant side, you're going to have to label nucleophile, then you're going to have to do electrophile. Electrophile. Every nucleophile needs an electrophile. Every electrophile needs a nucleophile. Okay, so what's an electrophile? I do like this. Okay, now why do I draw it like that? Well, E stands for electrophile. Usually you can see it has a positive charge or a delta positive. So it's either a full positive or a delta positive. And then this is an unhybridized p orbital. Okay, and you're going to see 
Why is that? Because electrophiles, what's file mean? They love electrons. Okay, file, nucleophile loves a positive. And where do electrons go? Electrons love going into an unhybridized p orbital of an electrophile. Okay, electrons are negative, they love positive. They're going after a nucleus. All right, so th there's why you always want to um, decide whether you have a pol polar moment, a pol the polarity, the polar bond. Okay, so. Some people say, oh, organic chemistry is just a nothing but memorization. I'm like, no. Um, well, maybe language is memorization. I mean, how do we communicate with tree and car? I mean, there is memorization there, I agree. But when I went through, I'm just like, it's really about plus and minus. If you can label a nucleophile, and you say, there's your negative, and you put in your um, your dipole moment where this is positive, and this is negative, all of a sudden, you found your electrophile, folks. Like that's really everything you do for your 180 reactions. Most of them is finding a nucleophile and finding an electrophile, and you always draw, you see? I mean, this is what I do in my papers when I'm I'm stressed out and I'm taking exams, because I went back to school in my, when I was 30, two years old for my PhD. I always just draw this. I put my name on the paper, and then I draw this, okay? So that way I do not draw my reaction electron flow arrow the wrong way. For me, this is a big deal because if I did that on one paper, on one exam, on those Saturday exams, they're like qualifying exams, I don't care if I did eight pages of organic chemistry. If I did this electron flow arrow the wrong way, my paper got thrown out, okay? So um, this is called the electron flow arrows, and they always go from the nucleophile because that's where your electrons go, to the electrophile. And so now we have to draw the electron flow arrows. This is your nucleophile, folks, right here. I mean, I'm sorry, right here. See the like, nucleophile, and they're going to go to the electrophile. See how it goes to the carbon? And we have to do two arrows because then those electrons are going to go with iodine, and we call this the leading group. Okay? So you're going to have to identify your nucleophile. It's always going to be your negative charge your electrophile, and then your leaving group, okay? Now you have to draw products. So you already told yourself what to do. So now this carbon has oxygen and hydrogen, so you have a new bond here, okay? And you have sodium, so it's going to hang out, and then the iodide left. Okay, so you have that, and we don't really care too much about that. We do care about this. So you went from an alkyl halide functional group. What's this functional group? This is methanol. Okay, this is an alcohol. So you're able to convert, synthesize an alkyl halide into an alcohol. It's pretty powerful, folks. Okay, so this is your product. This is your organic product. So a lot of times they'll say, predict the organic product. Okay, that's the one with the carbon. Okay, so the nucleophile, you'll have to rank the strength of nucleophiles. We'll rank the strength of nucleophiles, and you'll have to classify your electrophile. Okay, so we're going to figure out how that works. Now, the other thing you have is... Um, the two. Okay, so we've talked about um, substitution. Nucleophilic pi molecular. So we're still breaking down the word SN2. So substitution. Let's draw this reaction. Okay, so I'm going to show you something else when I draw it again. Okay, and I like to write like sodium hydroxide, and then I like for you to redo your um, Lewis structure. That's the problem solving. 
Okay, so what have we already decided? You all recognize that this is our nucleophile, and I'm fine with you just writing like that. I understand that's a nucleophile. And here's your carbon. This is your electrophile, okay? So you have to identify those. And then the um, electrons go from this lone pair to the electrophile, and then this is your leaving group. You can write LG for leaving group, okay? So you don't have to write all those words out. Now we have to be able to draw products. Okay, so this is where substitution comes comes in, right? So the nucleophile, the OH, is going to substitute. So let's write a word out here. Nucleophile, which is the OH minus, will substitute the leaving group, which is iodide minus, because it takes its electrons, um, for, well, I'll just write, let's see, I'm making these in, to make an alcohol. Okay, so here we draw our product. And then you have sodium hanging out and iodide would hang out. Okay, they would pretty much, could, you could precipitate them out. All right, um, now, what about the two, folks? So we understand um, what, what about this two? Okay, as in two. Okay, that has to do with the rate law. Okay, and we're going to talk about um, which reactions happen. Which reactions happen. And the reaction that happens is always the fastest on this. This is a kinetic. Okay, so the one that happens the fastest is the one that happens. And you know, that's the one you get like 99% yield. These reactions are important. At Eli Lilly, when I worked there for six years, there was not probably one single week that went by that I didn't do some form of an S and two reaction. Okay, so this is a reaction that you would do a lot in synthesis. Now, um, so what I want to show you here is that the the rate law is this. Okay, um, so the rate law is is a second order. So the rate equals K for the reaction times the concentration of iodomethane and times the concentration of OH minus, okay? That means if you increase your concentration of OH minus, the rate, so if you increase this, the rate's gonna increase. If you increase your iodomethane, the rate's going to increase, okay? How many things are these? One, two, two, by molecular. And that's what the two means. What other reaction are we going to talk about, folks? We're going to be talking about an SN1, okay? And you're going to see that that rate law, the rate depends on just the concentration. In this case, it will be the concentration of the iota methane, okay? And see, that's a one. That's a one thing. So that's why you get SN1. It's about the rate law. So the fastest reaction, the rate, depends only on the concentration. And you're going to see that you can throw in um, your nucleophile. You still have to have a nucleophile, an electrophile, but it affects the rate zero, okay, for an SN1. And that's where we're going to break down the mechanism of both of these reactions. And you're going to have to classify. I'm going to tell you right now, iodomethane would never do an SN1 reaction, okay? You're going to get something to do an SN1 reaction. You're going to get something like this. This is a great substrate. What is that? We'll classify it. This carbon that's bonded to this halogen is bonded to how many carbons? One, two, three. So that's a tertiary alpha halide. Okay. So tertiary alpha halides um, do fast SN1. Primary alkyl halides do super fast uh, SN2 reactions. So that's the rate law that's been determined 
experimentally. Okay, the other thing we need to see is um, uh, the reaction um, coordinate um, energy diagram, reaction energy diagram. Okay, so you're going to have to be able to match a reaction energy diagram for an SN1 and SN2 and just in general reactions. Okay, so part of it's just learn how to communicate with graphs. So let's do our energy goes up. This is your reaction coordinate. Um, okay, so here is our reaction. So let's do our reaction here. CH3 iodide plus OH minus goes to CH3OH plus, let's do sodium, sodium iodide. Okay, so we care about the methanol and we care about the starting material here, starting material. What is this? This is your electrophile. This is your nucleophile. This is your product. We're going to label our graph, okay? That's what we care about. So, but where, what do we, okay, do we have a valley here? This is our product, okay? This is our starting material. Okay, so starting material and product. We're, so we don't have a valley. We don't have an intermediate, okay? So there's no valley. There's no intermediate. And this is the way all reaction energy diagrams look for an SN2 reaction, folks. Okay? So let's look. We do have a transition state. You see that? That's, that's how you see. That's just a, that means transition state. Okay, you might see people go TS like that. So I, transition state is the peak. Okay? And we know that the difference between this height and that height is our AE. What's AE? Activation energy. Okay, that's going to be our, that's always our rate limiting step, the highest peak. And so transition states, we don't actually know the actual, um, but we can speculate the structure. And so what we have here is it's called backside attack. This is very important. Backside attack. This is the mechanism. Okay. And you get inversion of stereochemistry. So if you're filling out those reaction sheets, that last section is where you put this in. Okay. So we're going to put our iodide here. I'm going to tell you what backside attack is. Okay. So here's our nucleophile. And what happens is this OH, I'm sorry, this is our electrophile, this is our nucleophile. Okay, so this, oh, the nucleophile will attack the electrophile, but it will go behind, you got to show this, it will go behind the leaving group. Okay, so I is your leaving group. It's kind of like uh, a, a baseball bat hitting the ball. It knocks it out, okay? So it is actually going into this orbital here, okay? This is an anti-bonding orbital, and it puts these electrons from the oxygen here, and that weakens the bond. So to draw the transition state here, when you draw transition states, and you can see this in your book, you draw these dotted well, you don't need to put X because we know what X is. So you put this, so here's carbon. That bond is breaking and the bond, this bond is forming at the same time. And then what happens is this hydrogen goes up like that and then we get hydrogen here. Now, in transition states, you always have to show these dashes and wedges, 
okay? So you're going to see that you get inversion of stereochemistry. So this is a bracket. This is transition state. And you're showing that the bond from the leaving group is breaking as the nucleophile is coming in. And then your new substrate looks like this. Okay, this is called actually Walden's inversion. And they, um, I wonder if you have a picture of a, an umbrella. I can try. So you, you go out and you have your umbrella. Okay, so you have your little umbrella here. And then the wind catches it. Okay, and then it becomes an inverted umbrella. Okay. So it's that inversion, and that's uh, Walden's inversion. So the transition state here for this one up here would be this right here. If you want to draw that. So that is your transition state. You have your product. Okay, so what else can you determine about this? Well, you can probably figure out your delta H. Can you use bond dissociation energies to calculate delta H? No, you can't. No bond dissociation energies because this is heteroletic cleavage, folks. Heteroletic. Heteroletic cleavage, okay? You get um, pluses and minuses. You got nucleophiles and you got electrophiles. These are charged species. They're not homolytic cleavage, okay? The leaving group. What does the leaving group look like when it leaves? It's a negative. Okay, we don't use bond association energies for that. So we're not going to calculate them. We're not going to do that. Okay. Um, so if you look, that describes SN2, an energy diagram. Okay, now I'm on page 300 in your book. I'm looking at some SN2 summary reactions. Um, the best thing for you to do at this point um, is to familiarize yourself with the different kinds of nucleophiles on that page. You have iodide. You have hydroxyl. You have um, OR. What's that R? Yeah, that could just be any kind of carbon. Okay. What do all these have in common? Thiol, SH. You have SR. That's a thiol ether. That would be an S carbon. You have um, NH3. You have an azide. Azides are always funky to draw your um, sodium azide. Do y'all ever see? Sodium azide is what's in your car and it will spontaneously detonate. You gotta be careful when you work at with them. I knew a wonderful friend from Alabama and that thing detonated. Got chemicals all over him. He was okay though. But uh, what happens if in a car accident, if you hit this with a certain enough pressure, mechanical pressure, it will detonate and give off uh, nitrogen gas. Anything that can give off nitrogen gas, you gotta be careful with. So azides, a lot of times you don't want to heat them past 65 degrees Celsius. Okay, but that fills that nitrogen, fills your air bags. All right, there's a lot of practicality um, and uses for organic chemistry. Okay, this is a, an alkyne. It's actually called an alkyne ide. The ide is the negative charge, just language here. Okay, so you can see that you have a summary of nucleophiles. What do they all have in common, folks? Nucleophile. You're going to have some lone pairs. We haven't even seen any double bonds yet. That's not until chapter 8, okay? Um, but negative charges. Now you're going to have to rank them because remember, what you have to decide is what's going to be the fastest, okay? The fastest for an SN2. And so um, you're going to find that a negative charge is faster than a neutral, okay? So... Uh, if you had to compare between um, water 
as a nucleophile, it has lone pairs here versus a hydroxyl. And that's the kind of stuff we're going to be looking at in your um, SN2 Pogel. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this and tell you the trends, but that's what we're going to do with um, 9A. You're going to um, learn about the naming, the reaction, how to draw the transition states and look at the models. You'll draw a reaction energy diagram. You'll show the inversion of stereochemistry, and then you'll have to figure out um, which nucleophiles are strong, okay, because those will be fast. And then we'll look at the electrophile. So we're also going to look at the electrophile. But the negative charge, okay, so um, page 302 is excellent. And I would look at these pages while you're working your um, POGL. The page 302 has a table of common nucleophiles, and you see the strength, okay? So a negative charge, you'll notice all the strong ones all pretty much have a negative charge, okay? And that makes them a stronger nucleophile. Stronger nucleophile, what does that mean? Um, that means faster. That means your rate law. The rate equals K times your nu nucleophile times your electrophile. Okay? You increase that rate of reaction. That happens the fastest. Okay, so then you have trends of nucleophilicity. Okay, so now let's talk about the electrophile. Remember I told you you needed to classify the electrophile. Okay, so... Um, when you think of the electrophile, so you're talking about your alkyl halide. This is your electrophile that we've been talking about. Um, and it has a leaving group. Okay, so this is your electrophile, and you have a leaving group. And so the nucleophile will come in. the backside attack and leave. Okay, so your electrophile, it has to get in there. It has to get backside attack. How does it do that? That's about sterics, folks. Okay, we're still trying to figure out which one's going to be the fastest. We're looking at a rate law. Rate equals K times nucleophile concentration times electrophile. Okay, we're looking at a rate. And so hydrogens are small because they're rotating around like a windmill. Okay, so this is a methyl alkyl halide. You know, that's going to be so fast, it's going to happen before you can snap your fingers. Okay, you put those in a flask. What if you put a CH3 here? Okay, well, maybe I should write it out so you can see how big a CH3 is. Maybe you should make a model, all right? You're leaving groups here. Now, the nucleophile has to come in here has to get around this rotating CH3, because remember, this is rotating around a single bond. It's rotating, and, it's, and it has to get all the way in the backside there to kick that leaving group out. All right, what's that? That's a primary alkyl halide. That's going to happen fast, too. Okay, that's going to be fast. That's going to happen faster than you can sigh. <sighs> okay. As fast as you can, you know, so it's, it's going to happen fast, though. And then you have a secondary. Secondaries, eh, well, they're going to depend on what's on that secondary. So secondary is always going to be a gray area. Okay, so you got CH3, CH3 here, and you got iodide there. So you got two of these methyl groups. You want your nucleophile to get in here. And... But you've got these two secondaries. This is secondary, okay? This will happen. It won't happen that fast, but it will happen. This is going to happen, okay? But it's not a definite. You want a sure thing? These are sure things. These are sure reactions. They are going to be fast, okay? And that's your electrophile. Um, and that's when we'll talk about that in one of your um, POGO models. Let's look at... Um, Table 6.5 on page 307. And you have these on your PowerPoints. Those have relative rates of reaction. Okay, so let's look at that real quick. 
So you have CH3 bromide. That happens greater than 1,000, the relative reaction rates, okay? Um, CH3, CH2, Br, this is a primary, because you see this carbon bonded to the leaving group is bonded to one other carbon. That's primary. This is methyl. That is, looks like that. That's 50, 50 to 1. Okay, positive numbers. It should all be positive, I guess. Okay, what about this? CH3, I'm writing the condensed formula here. What does that look like? All right, so we see this is a secondary, right? This carbon is bonded to two other carbons. That's a secondary alkyl halide. That's a reaction rate of one, okay? So, Remember, I said these are sure things. Those are happening fast. Okay, so now what do we have when we have a tertiary? Less than 0 0.0001. Folks, that's not happening. No. No SN2. Okay? No SN2. Um, now, this one here is a 20. Okay? So, it... It's up here, but it's not as fast as this one. What's the difference? Sterics, okay? This one has a, a, a train. Think of a, a bride's train here. This is flopping around, and the nucleophile has to get to this carbon fax out attack. It has to get to that carbon, okay? And that, that there's like a tail. It's going to kind of knock it out, but that's so it's 20. These are experimental. Okay, what do you got here? You got... Okay, so even though this is primary, now you've got this here, and this is a 2. So you see, even though it's primary, you still have to look. This is branching, okay, and branching. So this is, not all primaries are equal. This is a primary, this is a primary, but this has a branching. And so it will um, keep that nucleophile from getting into that um, electrophilic carbon. This one here. Very interesting here. This has a terbutyl group, even though this is a primary, but it is um, pretty much slow, okay? So it's very, very slow, even though it's a primary. So that shows you a thing called steric hindrance. Um, okay, so we've talked a little bit about the stereochemistry. Uh, let's do one more thing on the stereochemistry. Okay, so this is a stereospecific reaction. Okay, stereospecific reaction means we have to show stereochemistry. Okay, so you have inversion of stereochemistry. So you have inversion. So what does this mean? If you have a compound such as this, okay, and you react this with sodium hydroxide, okay, this is going to come from the top side, opposite, and the bromine is going to leave. So this is your leaving group. This is a secondary electrophile, okay, secondary alkyl halide. You could probably even name that, right? Cyclopentane, okay, the bromine and the CH3 are on the same side, that makes them cis, and you have cis-1-bromo-3-methyl cyclopentane. See how you're learning all this stuff? Now, you have to show inversion of stereochemistry. All right, you didn't touch anything over here, so you redraw that the same. But now your OH is up, okay? And so this is trans one, well, now you have an alcohol, so you gotta name it different. But it'd be trans three bromo cyclo pentan all, okay? So that's showing you inversion of stereochemistry, and it's a stereospecific reaction.
um, for SN1, I think I'll just make another SN1 video, and then we'll go into your Pogol. And also do the comparison of SN1 and SN2 on another um, lecture.